Hi, I'm James Dickey, Senior Trial Counsel for the Upper Midwest Law Center, the Minnesota nonprofit public interest law firm that fights for liberty and the rule of law. Welcome back to Minnesota Law Weekly, where Doug Seaton and I update you on important developments on legal issues in Minnesota and how we at UMLC are your voice fighting for you in the courts. Today, we are talking about legal developments in the courts and in the legislature related to life and religious liberty issues. And to speak on this is these issues, I am joined by Renee Carlson of True North Legal, which is also a Minnesota public interest law firm. Welcome, Renee, and we are grateful to have you on the podcast. Well, thank you, James. It's good to be here. I've appreciated working with you in the last couple of years in Upper Midwest Law Center. You guys do really great work. Thank you, Renee. Really appreciate that. And it's also great to work with you. But let's talk a little bit about True North Legal. So tell us about what your focus is. Sure. True North Legal is a legal initiative of Minnesota Family Council, and we work to defend life, family, and religious freedom in Minnesota. And we work in public policy, we do education initiatives, and we work in the courts. So I tell people it's like a three-legged stool where we kind of hit each of those um, parts and they work together uh, very well. So if there's something going on in policy, we can give a voice to the legislature, we can give legal analysis, we can help equip citizens so that they can engage in policy. And if things go awry at the legislature, we have the capacity to litigate in the courts. Well, there's a lot there, so let's Definitely. break, let's break that down. It's a full down. load. <laughs> it sure is. So uh, let me start with the courts, which is sure. Upper Midwest Law Center's primary battleground. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us about any initiatives you have related to litigation. Well, James, I started at True North Legal at the beginning of COVID, so that was um, quite exciting. And one of our cases we had during COVID was similar to yours with churches um, being told that they can't continue to have worship services despite putting different sort of protections in place and abiding by all of the regulations that were put in place with COVID. We had a church in um, southwest Minnesota that was told that they couldn't host a worship service. Not only that, but that they couldn't host it outside. Wow. And it was in conjunction with a ministry event that they were having, an mm -hmm. annual event that they had every year where they had a motorcycle ride and raised money. And after this motorcycle ride, they would come together and they would worship in their parking lot. Wow. So they were told that that was absolutely off the table. Um, and we ended up stepping in, and because of our advocacy, we were able to help this church not only be able to have their worship service, but also have their ministry event in which they received a record number of donations wow. and were able to purchase motorcycles for pastors across the country in Africa. They raised a record number of donations, so they bought 48 motorcycles to help a ministry in Africa. So wow. True North Legal had a really amazing start with respect to our advocacy efforts, not only helping locally, but helping across the world. That's great. Um, so, you know, going along the theme of, of COVID, we've also been involved in some employment decisions and working with Upper Midwest Law Center in one of our EEOC cases that is ongoing. Um, and we've also engaged in amicus briefs at the United States Supreme Court. One of the briefs that we worked on was the Dobbs brief on behalf of Vice President Mike Pence in Advancing American Freedom, as well as many other family policy organizations. We asked the court to overrule Roe v. Wade and Casey. And in fact, they did, and they've returned this decision to the states. And so now we at True North Legal are also engaging in the battleground at the state legislature. And that's a pretty heavy battleground at this point. Um, it must be a real honor for you to be able to advocate in all these different ways on behalf of life and family issues in Minnesota with True North Legal. It is, and it's something that I've always felt called to do. So I do feel very honored to be making a difference here for the people in Minnesota. And so you specifically mentioned to me um, that the legislature is essentially getting rid of what we have described on this podcast as common sense bipartisan abortion restrictions that were originally struck down by the court in Ramsey County over the last summer. And so right now the, le the legislature is trying to pass laws that essentially go beyond what mm -hmm. the court did in that case. Um, so what do these proposed laws look like? Well, I think it's good to start with the foundation of House File 1 and Senate File 1, which was known as the PRO Act. And that is what created this fundamental right to abortion in the legislature. It's such a broad bill, James. You and I have talked about this. Mm -hmm. um, it gives a right to any individual. So they struck the word woman, and now this applies to any individual. Um, and it's concerning because this applies to minors. Right. But this unfettered access to abortion, and not only abortion, but they also have a right to reproductive health services. That explicitly includes sterilization and it is including but not limited to. So that opens the door to right. many other services um, that could be harmful to women and young girls. 
James, not only is this a fundamental right to abortion, but there's no gestational limits. Mm. So this puts Minnesota on par with countries like China and North Korea. This is an extreme abortion regime, wow. and it's actually out of step with 70% of Minnesotans. This just isn't Minnesota values. And I wish I could say it stops there, but there's another bill that I'm calling the How-To Bill, which is House File 91 and Senate File 70, which repeals and removes many of Minnesota's protective laws with respect to women and girls who are seeking an abortion. These are just health and safety protections, consumer protections that were passed with bipartisan legislation. So we're talking about parental notification, simply notifying parents if their daughter, a young girl, is going to get an abortion. Mm -hmm. Informed consent, where a woman who is seeking an abortion is simply receiving information about the procedure. But this bill also would repeal and remove the Infants Born Alive Protection Act. And it's pretty astounding because, as I said in my testimony, what happens to infants who do survive an abortion? Are they left to die in a cold metal table? And without a mandate from the state legislature, it appears that that would be the case. And that, this, that, oh, is, that is just absolutely incredible, incredibly bad. Um, and you would think, you know, whether you are a proponent of abortion or you oppose it, that something like that would be so egregious and out of step with how we feel about policy and our laws in Minnesota. It's just not Minnesota values. And, and so I gather, you know, House File 91, Senate File 70, if passed and signed as is, would give animals greater rights than preborn children in Minnesota. That's right, James. And, and it would legalize, as I see it, if you're letting kids die on a metal table in the operating room, it legalizes infanticide. That's right. Um, that's, that's an astounding thing. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak more about from a public policy perspective, how concerning this is? Well, I think, like I said, it doesn't matter what where you fall with respect to your position on abortion, that this is these are extreme abortion laws. We stand to be one of the most extreme states in the country with respect to abortion if this passes. And I mean, it just begs the question of what do we think about human beings? I mean, do we really value them? And at what point are we going to say that this is just too much, that if a child survives an abortion and is left to die on a cold metal table, but yet we have regulations and restrictions for animal breeding, you know, where's our common sense? Right. This just doesn't seem consistent um, with our Minnesota values and how we should be making public policy. You know, and you know, I don't think you'll hear much about this, and I haven't, and I try to follow what's going on in the mainstream media, but you really don't hear much about these kinds of issues in the mainstream media these, these days. Um, and, and maybe part of the problem seems to me to be that the legislature is moving at a tremendous speed Absolutely. at this point. Um, and so, you know, the legislature is supposed to be a deliberative body that's supposed to think through issues and have that's testimony, right. adequate testimony to have an understanding of what the impact of the, the legisla legislation might be. But if you're uh, moving at light speed and, and stopping testimony from happening and, and just kind of ramming things through the legislature because you have uh, both houses and the governor, um, you really, I mean, from a, as a, from a lawyer and a litigator's perspective, you're setting yourself up for a lot of litigation. That's right. Um, and so it really, but it really seems to me that it, it would be prudent to, if you're going to throw out longstanding precedent, especially bipartisan, um, le legislation like mm -hmm. the current restrictions that are still on the books in Minnesota on abortion, you should deliberate on it and have serious debate. Um, but I've seen limitations on testimony on these laws as mm -hmm. short as maybe 10 minutes for an entire topic. Yeah. Sometimes um, not even talked about it at all. There's no opportunity for public discussion or public discourse. We've been told anywhere from 60 seconds to two minutes um, to be able to talk about something as extreme as this abortion legislation or gender legislation or things about our taxes. Um, speaking of, this this bill would also, that I just mentioned, um, give unfettered access to abortion on the taxpayer's dime. Right. So we're talking about a broad spectrum of impact that has not given sufficient sufficient time for robust public debate. Um, there's also a limitation on how many people can testify and even a limitation sometimes on who can testify. I had to make the case that I actually submitted my inquiry to testify um, during one hearing, that I did it properly, um, and it was debated in front of me on the record whether <laughs> I actually gracious. submitted and was able to, should have been able to testify. Thankfully, thanks to some legislators, I was able to testify. But the point being is that if I, as an attorney, you know, working in this space, I'm tracking bills and I'm am on top of things. How is the public supposed to know? If right. I feel like I'm precluded from these conversations and opportunities, the general public certainly must feel like a, even worse than that. 
So it's it's I can only it's imagine very, that's true. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's just concerning again that we are changing the whole composition of Minnesota, doing it, like you said, at a lightning pace without public discourse. And that should be something that all Minnesotans should start paying attention to and start engaging as best as they can and letting their voices be known that this is a swift pace. Changing Minnesota is not consistent with their values. You know, and, and uh, you know, it's when you mentioned the taxpayer funding issue, too, I mean, we've there is a Minnesota case from back in the 70s mm-hmm. called McKee versus Likens that actually established what's called taxpayer standing. Uh, to object to certain types of expenditures, and it actually related to abortion expenditures back then. Um, and so I can only imagine, again, that this is another example of the legislature just doing something and maybe not having a full um, con- con- conception of what exactly they're getting themselves into and what they're setting up the attorney general to have to defend right. at some point. And we know that a majority of Americans don't agree with abortion on demand paid on the taxpayer's dime. So again, right. they are setting themselves up for some work ahead if they're going to pass this law. Right. And so they've got some, some obviously some policy issues, but, you know, obviously we're looking at it from as well, you know, UMLC, we look mm-hmm. at these kinds of issues from the legal perspective and just see, you know, there's a lot of problems that litigation may have to end up solving. That's right. It, it's a disheartening thing, wouldn't you say, that, that you know, that, that you talked about before that you as a lawyer who are who is constantly involved in educating people about the policy implications of these laws, uh, you have to work so hard just to stay up with what they're doing right. right now. And the, the average citizen, it's supposed to be a citizen-driven mm-hmm. legislature. So it seems like the, the statements by the legislature that, you know, citizens should be involved and should set up to testify is just lip service. Mm-hmm. I, it, it does feel like at this session, really with no notice or very little notice, as little as 24 hours to get in a written testimony or to even testify orally, just feels like we, they're shutting the public out. And as you said, if we're going to be changing the fabric of Minnesota, we need to have a robust public discourse about what is the direction that we're going in. And the citizens need to be able to actively engage in that. And at this point, it's really hard to do that. You know, let's, and, and it, it's a really difficult issue that I, and I, I do hope the legislature thinks hard about the laws it's passing before it ends up in, lit, in litigation. And one other issue that appears to be headed to the courts, frankly, if it's passed, is this proposed ban on Christian and other faith-based universities participating in the Minnesota PSEO program. And, and that seems like a straightforward violation of the First Amendment. So can you speak to that issue a little bit? Sure. Well, James, the PSEO program historically is, um, involves a diverse group of colleges, technical colleges, religious schools that all participate in this program. As an, and as I understand, students choose whether they want to participate in PSEO and which college they're going to go to. So a handful of schools have re- are religious schools, as I mentioned, and they have a statement of faith. And they're allowed to have that statement of faith under current state and federal law. And in fact, it's what makes the culture of those schools so unique and what draws people to those schools. Mm -hmm. But at this point, House File 1269 is what you're referring to, is trying to say that those schools simply, based on their religious viewpoint, can no longer participate in PSEO. And I want to jump in here because what's also significant to me is, as you're talking about these uh, PSEO programs, is that none of these courses offered by these, you know, faith-driven institutions are religious in nature. They're not teaching theology. Mm-hmm. And, and so, you know, what's the big deal? It's not like they're, they're doing something. They're teaching non-sectarian uh, information. They're teaching a normal college course. That's right. And they've been doing so for a number of years. They're doing so because that's what that's what the statute requires. It already precludes these schools from going into a deep dive of courses that are religious in nature. These are non-sectarian courses. So arguably, there's really nothing to fix. I think that this law is just in search of a problem. And it seems like an attack on religious schools, and that is a complete violation of the First Amendment. And, and on that front, you know, the, the Supreme Court has been very clear. That's right. Right? That this is this is not allowable to, to discriminate just based on the religious identity of a school. Especially in the, la- the last couple of years, even in the last five years, we've seen Carson B. Macon, Espinoza, Trinity Lutheran College, and Carson B. Macon is probably the most consistent with this issue here, where they said that they answered the question, do, do, does the government have to pay for religious schools? No, it doesn't. But once it chooses to have a program right. where it allows all schools to participate, it can't single out a school based on their viewpoint on religion. They cannot right, exactly. contribute to discrimination based on viewpoint. viewpoint. Right. I mean, it's, so it's, it's very simple. It's like you, it's the same thing with the First Amendment analysis, typically. You open up your hallways or your classrooms or whatever to one side of the issue, um, you can't just ignore the other side and say you're out because you're religious. That's I mean, right. it's very straightforward. 
you know, discrimination is, it's almost like an equal protection clause for uh, religious institutions under the First Amendment. Well, on that note, you know, what was concerning is that there's a lot of discussion in committees, you can imagine. And the narrative is that this is exclusionary. This excludes people. And I do agree. This is exclusionary. But who it excludes is those who have a sincerely held religious belief. This is saying that everyone else can participate. But if you have a statement of faith, if you are a person of faith right. and you hold to a certain religion and the composition of your school is motivated by a certain mission, Mission, you, because of your viewpoint, cannot participate in the PSEO program. And that is just a violation of the First Amendment. Right. That is outright exclusion and outright religious bigotry. And, and I, I want to make sure I get to this point, and I think I already mentioned it in passing, but you know, I think that my understanding of one of the reasons that people are pushing this bill is that they're worried about the Establishment Clause. Mm -hmm. But I think I've got a, a quote from the Supreme Court that it says that simply allowing students to attend religious schools does not fund religion mm -hmm. or violate the Establishment Clause. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that that to me seems to be a pretty Right, there really is statement. no problem. The U.S. Supreme Court has been very clear on that, especially in the last five years. So that argument really doesn't stand. And again, as you had mentioned earlier, the statute as written currently specifically says that this is going to non-sectarian courses. Right. So where is the problem? Right, where's the beef? Mm -hmm. um, and it basically what it seems to me, and uh, you, know, I've talked, you and I have talked about this, is that it seems like a government mandate to take away choices from students, mm -hmm. right? I mean, talk about a little bit about, you know, why would we want to limit the places that a student could go to get PSEO credit? Talk about that. Well, that is going to be a problem because there are many students that want to participate in the PSEO program, and they want to do so for various reasons. It might be because a school has a certain program that they're really interested in. Um, I know students that have been planning since sixth grade mm -hmm. to go to PSEO because it eliminates their um, college debt that right. they might acquire in the future. Um, it might be the location. So for all of these reasons, there's opportunities for students students to go to varying schools that offer PSEO. But if we start saying that certain schools can't participate, we have more students that want to participate in PSEO and less opportunities. That's not going to create a robust um, opportunity for students in Minnesota. And I think that's really going to diminish opportunity. Students deserve choices and they deserve more choices in Minnesota, not less choices. Yeah, I fully agree. And, and there's no doubt to me that if this law is passed, that this ban on faith-based institutions participating in PSCO is going to be thrown out by the federal courts. Mm -hmm. um, the state might as well start writing the attorney fee check. Uh, <laughs> and that's true with a lot of different bills advancing through the legislature. They're going to be struck down in the courts, and we at UMLC are preparing legal challenges to those. Well, Renee, thank you so much for being here. Can you tell the listeners how they can support you at True North Legal? Sure. They can go check out our website at truenorthlegal.org. And that's on the Minnesota Family Council website. You can click to give a donation. You can also read about our work on the website. Thank you so much for having me, James. It's an honor to talk about True North Legal. And it's an honor to partner with you on many of the things that we're working on here to keep Minnesota a great place for all of us. Thanks, Renee. And, and I strongly recommend that everyone listening does what Renee just did. Go to truenorthlegal.org. Click on their uh, website, donate to them. And those who disagree with what this legislature is doing should support them and Upper Midwest Law Center now more than ever, as it's still a way that you can fight back against one party rule that is radically changing Minnesota. Well, that's it for this week on Minnesota Law Weekly. You can learn more about the Upper Midwest Law Center by visiting umlc.org. And you can also make a confidential tax deductible donation on our website or by sending us a check to 8421 Wyzetta Boulevard, Suite 300, Golden Valley, Minnesota, 55426. And again, you can also make a tax-deductible contribution and donation to True North Legal at truenorthlegal.org. Thank you, and we'll see you next week.